So this morning I'm delighted to bring on the show James Corbett. Now, the reason I'm delighted to bring him on the show is because I am so looking forward to things that he has to share with us with respect to what would be referred to as invasion of certain privacies. So, James, if you'll come on the show, please tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit how, about how you got involved in what you do. I would appreciate it. Okay, well, uh, the long story uh, form of this is available on my site, CorbettReport.com, where I've talked about uh, my background. But long story short is that I'm a Canadian who's been living in Japan for 14 years now. I came over here just originally to teach English for a year, see a little bit of the world, make some money, and then go back home to Canada. But, well, you know, these things happen. One year turns into two, turns into (laughs) ten, turns into 14. So here I am with a family in Japan. But along the way, I started encountering these crazy conspiracy theory videos on YouTube about 9-11 that I found interesting. And um, at first I was poo-pooing them. Oh, this is just silly, crazy conspiracy nonsense. Uh, But the more I looked into it, the more I found, well, there's actually something to that. Oh, I can actually look up that document. Oh, I just found that piece of information. Oh, it's actually true. And that led me down the rabbit hole, as it were, as I'm sure uh, your audience is familiar with that experience. And that's Uh, ultimately how I ended up starting my own website, which I never in my life thought I was going to do, and started a weekly podcast, which suddenly flowered into videos and interviews and articles, and here I am a good 11 years later, and I do this full-time now. Um, I'm blessed by the support of people out there to be able to do this uh, work. Isn't that fascinating? And, you know, when you talk about those conspiracy theories, I know that when I first started to hear about the conspiracy theories, I, like you, I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. But then, as those documents started to turn up, it was like, hmm, wait a minute, there's got to be something to this. And now I look at the world in a whole different way, through a different set of glasses, if you will. So when we talk about us as American citizens, and we talk about our privacies. I know you've spent a lot of time doing research on this, and you even have a, I believe it's a podcast that's out there, The Five Privacies You Didn't Know You Lost. And I find that interesting because I, for one, am not a real tech wizard by any stretch of the imagination, and I was one of those people who was naive to the possibilities of people learning more about me than I might want them to know through the technology that I have. That's right. This is one of the uh, early conspiracies that I picked up on and covered on my site back when this was still crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. And I remember talking seven, eight, nine, ten years ago about things like the CALIA Act, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act of 1994, which basically hardwired in backdoors for the FBI and other government alphabet soup agencies uh, into the backdoors of the telecommunication systems there in the United States, and was the, uh, not really the start, but at least the formalization in law of the the wedding of uh, the intelligence agencies to the telecommunications industry. And of course, it's only proceeded from there, and in the age of the internet, We know what that ultimately became with, uh, what was it, Room 641 that was exposed uh, in the AT&T building in San Francisco, was it? Where uh, we have this door that we can't open and only the NSA is allowed to open it. But we know that the trunk lines of the Internet go into that room um, because of the schematics that that we have of the building. Uh, And suddenly it's revealed, oh, yeah, of course, the NSA is in the back door of the Internet tapping everything that goes on. So I've been talking about this for years and warning people about it, but... It is only in recent years that this has started to catch on in the general public that, oh, they really are spying. And of course, Edward Snowden and things like that brought it to the forefront of the public's attention. But I still think people don't really have a handle on what, how big this issue is and how important it is. Uh, and for that bigger picture, I would suggest people start taking a look at the, uh, the reporting that's going on right now, even in the mainstream, about China. And look at China's surveillance system that they're putting into place. They're putting in this facial recognition cameras everywhere, and they've got this social credit system where they score people based on how good a citizen they are, and they'll be able to detect you and and, and see your your social credit score instantaneously, and will be able to deny you access to certain places, or you won't be able to take buses or that kind of thing if your social credit score isn't good enough. And that's being reported in the mainstream media right now in the West because... China is the boogeyman, China is the enemy. Look, they are doing these horrible things. 
But is there anyone in the audience right now, anyone, however skeptical, who can look at what's happening in China right now and say that that is not going to happen in that way eventually everywhere around the globe? Is there a government that's going to, in this current day and age, stand up and say, no, we won't do that to our citizens? I don't think anyone can look at themselves in the mirror and say that for certain that they uh, they believe that that's not the case. We know it's coming, and this is what it looks like. And this is the ultimate implication of this, where all of our lives, all of our data are being fed to the government and corporations behind the scenes. They are going to use that data, and ultimately it's going to weed out people like us who talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about. Uh, ultimately, we're going to be... Uh, assigned the bad credit scores and denied basic services. And we can all see this coming. And the sad reality is it is coming. You know, I was looking at a report on China and I was looking at what's happening over there. And one of the things that I found interesting was, again, depending upon your score, and they've set the criteria, so depending upon your score, you may not even be able to send your child to the school you want to send your child to. And I mean, to me, talk about an invasion, that's just a little bit more than I can handle as far as wanting other people in my life. But to your point, if it can happen there, why can't it happen everywhere else? And why wouldn't it happen everywhere else when governments feel like they should be privy to all of this information? You, you are not living your own life anymore. And for me, that's sad. It's very sad. I know that I get on this radio show, and I was mentioning this during the second hour. I get on this radio show, and I talk about things that go against the grain in the conventional world. So I know I'm under someone's microscope. I know people are watching me and listening very closely to what I have to say. But when you talk about that room 641, and you talk about all this information coming into this central location, if you will, do they do they look at keywords? How do they how do they decide which people they're going to look at? Well, we are looking through the glass darkly. We can only come at this from the outside, from what is eventually leaked out. If things are leaked out on purpose or not, we don't know. So we only have the partial information, and the only people who really know the in the innards of this are the whistleblowers themselves, and not just. Edward Snowden, of course, he's the one that uh, that got all of the public attention and the public focus. But there were NSA whistleblowers who had been shouting from the rooftops about this for years before him. People like Bill Binney, people like Russ Tice, um, uh, Thomas Drake, and others who had been shouting about the fact the government is spying on you. They are doing this. And at first it was things like, oh, they're just flagging certain people. And only if you have contact with, you know, the, the LCIA, the boogeyman in other countries, or only, you know, suspicious people. And then it became, well, if you're related to someone who has contacts who are suspicious, and then it turned out, actually, no, it's really everyone. And, oh, we're not just kind of collecting keywords or ho honing in on metadata, as was thrown out. Now it turns out, I, actually, they're collecting everything. And uh, this is being revealed very gradually to the public, step by step, so that it still probably sounds like conspiracy theory to think that all of your phone calls and emails are being recorded and stored in the NSA uh, archives, but it is being revealed. And I remember vividly in the wake of the Boston bombing, uh, Boston Marathon bombing, where they were talking about uh, the the wife of the alleged bomber and, and uh, a conversation that she was having. And they were talking about this on CNN with a person who was an FBI source. He no longer worked with the FBI, but he had sources in the FBI. And he was saying, oh yeah, they were able to listen to her phone call and determine who she was talking to and blah, blah, blah. And the, the host actually stopped the program and said, excuse me, did you say they could listen to the phone call? But it happened weeks ago. What? How?" And he said, oh, uh, of course, they, they, they're collecting it all and they can go and hone in on any conversation weeks after the fact. And they're just now kind of bringing this out to the public. Again, the implications of this are so chill because we want to think that the people in these intelligence agencies are angels that are only there to safeguard the best interests of the public and public safety and all of this. But we know, I mean, we know that obviously not everyone in these agencies are angels. And even if they were, the implication is that some the bad apple could get in there one day. You know, I, I know it's a one in a million shot, but if a bad apple gets in there, it's really turnkey totalitarianism. All of the things are set up for the totalitarian kind of regime that we see in China right now, 
all it takes is it for it to be revealed to the public and put in place and it would be in it, it, it would already be all of the infrastructure is already there for it that's the the scariest part of this is that again people don't it's not it's not even that people don't see this going on they are actually willing willfully buying into it with all of the tech tech gadgets and goo gads and convenient things that they're purchasing that are helping to enable this technological enslavement grid that's ultimately what this amounts to and as you said the technology that we're buying into i mean that's just and the more and more we hear about 5g and the more and more we hear about you know faster internet speeds and you know you've got to have this and you've got to have that and you've got to stay connected and this is this is the world we live in and this is the best way to go and what people do is they buy into this is going to make your life so much better without ever thinking about the fact that this is going to give them easier access to anything and everything you know and do. Exactly right. And this is all being sold as smart technology. You want a smart home where everything is connected and, oh, if you're, if you're running out of wine or whatever, you know, your, your, uh, your home computer system will automatically be able to detect that and order you some new wine. Oh, isn't it so great? You don't have to lift a finger. <laughs> And it'll all be de delivered by Same Amazon drone. That's right. We've got to go into a break, but you're absolutely right about that. And I want to talk a little bit more about that when we return. Stay with us. This is Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway, visiting this morning with James Corbett, talking about privacy. Welcome back. You're listening to Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway. And I'm visiting this, visiting this morning with James Corbett and. You know, James, you were talking about smart technology, and coming from way back, okay, I was born in the early 1950s. I really have no problem flipping on a light switch. It just, it's part of what I do. But I remember just recently, I stayed in a smart home. This was a rental home. It was a vacation type situation, and I stayed in a smart home. And the first thing I noticed was that when I walked into the room, the lights automatically turned on, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. In the middle of the night, if I, if I have to get up out of bed... The lights are going to turn on. We got to we got to figure this out because I don't want that to happen. But the more interesting experience was when I went to take a shower the next morning. First of all, it took me forever to figure out how to take a shower in this smart shower. I really don't care if the water comes out more forcefully from the left than from the right. That matters not to me. I just want to get in there and get clean. I finally get the shower figured out, and and the lights turn off in the bathroom. Now, I mean, imagine this. I'm in a shower, and the lights turn off. So I have to open the door, kind of wave my arm to try to get the lights to turn back on. I had to do that several times while I was taking the shower. Now, if I were in my early 20s, I probably could have figured this all out in no time because that's the life that I lead in my, if I were in my early 20s. But not being that person, not being familiar with all of this smart technology, it was quite the experience spending a weekend in that home. Oh, I can certainly imagine. And yeah, isn't it f funny how smart technology makes us feel dumb for not knowing how to use it properly? But <laughs> but uh, it, it is, I mean, uh, that's an interesting experience, but it is part of the denaturing process of this technology, which uh, which makes us unfamiliar with the familiar. And for what purpose? I mean, for what ultimate end? Is this all really about convenience? Well, of course, it isn't just about that, although it is sold under that guise. But I think to understand the smart agenda and where it's going, it, you can take a look even at mainstream stories. Again, you don't have to venture out into conspiracy world for this. You could look um, in 2012, Wired.com reported, CIA chief will spy on you through your dishwasher. And they were reporting on then head of the CIA, David Petraeus, talking about how smart dishwashers and other smart appliances were going to be a treasure trove of geolocation information and other data that, that uh, intelligence agencies and others would be able to use to gather data on whoever they liked, ultimately. Um, again, they're openly talking about this and openly bragging about it, but it's still, it's conspiracy theory if you talk about it, you know, in any other context, right? Um, but... Uh, again, that gives us the window into what this this is all about. And again, we don't really have to speculate about this. We can look at even actual cases that have developed out of these types of technologies. For example, there was a uh, murder case 
it was a year or two years ago at this point, where part of the the the, the legal battle that was going on was that the police wanted access to Amazon's store of the Alexa records for this particular person because they had an Alexa in their home that presumably might have recorded some of the altercation that led to someone's death. And, well, that's valuable information, and, well, presumably Amazon stores this. So we'll go to them and subpoena them for that information. And I don't remember the details of that case. It's easy enough to search online if people are interested in it. But that was part of what was going on there. There was another story, or it was perhaps the same story, but it was related, where someone was uh, uh, hinged on whether that person was at home during these certain key hours or not. And it was their water usage, which was being recorded by some smart appliance or other, that ultimately was the key. Oh, they were at home at that time because their water was being used. Again, these this is not theoretical. This is actually starting to happen in law right now, in the open, in public legal cases. Can you imagine how much more of that data is being used, mined, stored, and otherwise accessed by the intelligence agencies behind the scenes? That's pretty scary. Now, now tell me this. Does Alexa really record things I do in my home? It absolutely does, and if you're not careful, it will send that information to other people, um, seemingly quite randomly. Uh, There was a story that I reported on a few months ago under the colorful title, Don't Be an Idiot, Get Rid of Alexa. (laughs) So search that on (laughs) your search engine of choice, preferably not Google, which does store all your information, of course. I use DuckDuckGo, but there are many alternatives out there. Um, But look up that. And in that video, I talked about the case uh, that developed earlier this year where there was a couple sitting in their home. Um, I can't remember where in the United States. I believe in Oregon. Um, where they were sitting in their home talking about uh, uh, home improvements they were doing. They needed some new hardwood floors. They were talking about this to each other. And they got a call from one of the, the man's employees in Seattle. And he said, stop what you're doing. Your, your, your Alexa device has been bugged or hacked. And I, I'm hearing everything you're saying. And he said, what are you oh my talking gosh, James, about? He didn't we, even believe it. We've got to go... We've got to go into a break, but I want to hear the rest of that story. Stay with us. This is Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway. We'll be back in just a few minutes after messages. Welcome back. This is Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway, visiting this morning with James Corbett. And James, I had to interrupt you. So if you wouldn't mind, start that story again. There were a couple sitting in their living room discussing home improvement and... They have an Alexa. And what happened? So they're sitting there discussing their home improvements. Oh, we need to replace the the flooring. We need some hardwood floors in here. And the man uh, gets a call from one of his employees in Seattle. And the employee says, stop what you're doing. Unplug your Alexa device right now. It's been hacked. And he says, what are you talking about? And the guy says, I can hear everything you are seeing. And he says, "What are, I, he didn't even believe him at first. And the guy says, no, I, I can hear. You guys are talking about hardwood floors. You're talking about renovating your home. And so the guy says, what on earth is going on? He does unplug the Alexa. He tries to f- figure it out. They go to the local news channel that reports on this. And Amazon comes back a, a few days later with a helpful uh, uh, basically statement about, oh, what happened here? Oh, it was all just this humorous mi- misunderstanding that happened. You see, Alexa thought that it heard the man utter the word Alexa. It must have misheard him say something that sounded like Alexa. So it it woke up and then it thought it he heard, uh, he said something like send message. And then at this point, supposedly, according to Amazon, Alexa said, to whom, out loud, but they didn't hear him when they were having this conversation. And then he said something that sounded like this man's name. So Alexa sent this message that they recorded then to this person. And because of this funny series of events, oh, look at that. Wow, doesn't isn't it crazy how this happened? Um, but following up on that, the MIT's uh, technology review, uh, a reporter for that, uh, wrote a, an article a few days after that saying, yes, Alexa is recording Monday, mundane details of your life, and it's creepy as hell. And uh, it, it, it's incredible the things that this person discovered about the amount of data that Alexa is, is re- collecting on you and that you can even access and see um, behind the scenes. 
Uh, it, it, the report goes on to say, Beyond all the things I've clearly asked Alexa to do, in the past several months, it has also tuned in frequently several times a day for no obvious reason. It's heard me complain to my dad about something work-related, chide my toddler about eating dinner, and talk to my husband. The kinds of normal, everyday things you say at home when you think no one else is listening. Again, this was in the MIT Technology Review just a few days later, and weirdly enough, it ends up with saying, well, you know, but Alexa's pretty, pretty, uh, convenient, so maybe I'll keep it in my home anyway. It's very strange the kind of mental gymnastics people are doing now to justify the fact that they know they are being spied on by this technology, but they're going to continue using it anyway. Well, and you know, Alexa Alexa is one thing, and certainly I've heard a lot of things about Alexa that don't, don't comfort me <laughs> at all. And knowing that there is a way for them to kind of capture all this data whether it's randomly or not, is not a comfortable feeling for me. But the other thing that, you know, I was naive about technology. I'm very naive about technology. But the other thing that I found out to be very interesting was having a cell phone, that cell phone, no matter whether it's turned off or not, is a way for them to spy on you, if you will. And I can remember thinking, oh, I'm all right. I turn it off. You know, I leave it downstairs. I go upstairs to bed. But that's not the case. Turning it off doesn't afford you any protection. Isn't that right? No, that is exactly correct. And one of the early indicators of this for people who were paying attention was actually on 9-11 when uh, Bush and his press entourage in Florida were being herded onto Air Force One and flown to Barksdale to go back to Washington. Uh, the press, uh, the, the gaggle of White House press reporters reported that you know, it was really strange. Uh, the Secret Service came around telling everyone not just to turn their cell phones off, but to physically take the battery out of their cell phones. And they thought, well, what? why? Can't we just turn it off? But that's a clue. No, you turn it off. That doesn't mean it's off. It just means that, you know, it's powered down, but it still has the battery running and it can still listen and, and record anything that's going on. And that's, that's a clue. For people in the know back, you know, 17 years ago now that, hey, there, this technology for a very long time has had the ability to listen into you. And we know that in the wrong hands, quote unquote, this technology could be used for the wrong purposes to spy on your every move. Yeah, that's exactly what the government's been doing. And now, of course, now it's becoming common knowledge. Yes, your phone is recording everything you do and everywhere you go. And uh, and even when you turn location da uh, data off, as people are finding out uh, with Android phones now, yeah, Google is still recording it. It's just that it's you can't even access your own data, but they can access it. So it's uh, it's incredible the amount of data that's being collected on people now. And again, people are just becoming aware of this. And with these new phones, you can't even take the battery out. Exactly right. Yeah. Try doing that with an iPhone. No, you can't. Oh, and the new Android phones, you can't take the battery out. I, you know, I find it fascinating that they've made it to be that way. I, I suppose, you know, and I know that they sell it under the guise of, well, it's so much more convenient. You don't have to worry about replacing the battery. You don't have to worry about taking the battery out like you used to with your old phone. <laughs> Okay, I would just I just assume be able to take my battery out and to disconnect, but that's not what happens. Now, one of the other things that is concerning to me, you've mentioned this, and I know that this is happening. I'm not naive to this, unfortunately. I wish I was sometimes. But if you Google something, Google captures all that data. And you made reference to DuckDuckGo, which is what we use here. DuckDuckGo is, you know, the search engine that we use. But it just amazes me that Google will do that. Now, I know for a fact that it happens, and people will say to me, nah, that doesn't happen. Are you kidding? That doesn't happen. I Googled something the other day, and within seconds, within seconds, I am getting advertisements for what I had Googled. So I know darn good and well that there was no reason that those advertisements would be coming across my computer unless they were capturing what I was doing on Google. Exactly right. Yes. And of course, this is always when it is revealed to the public, it's always put in that context of, well, we're just trying to serve you better ads. You know, you know, corporations will be corporations. They're just trying to make a buck out of it. But no, as always, this goes back to, well, who's 
who's really at the tops of these companies and who's running them and what connections do they have and how did these companies get started and where did their initial capital uh, funding come from? And when you start digging into companies like Google, there's always shadowy deep state connections going on there. For example, quite specifically, Google Earth, Google Maps that people take for granted now it's everyone uses on a daily basis, or not everyone, but a lot of people. Um, d most people don't know that that was originally something called Keyhole, and it came from a company called Keyhole, um, which had this incredible, you know, satellite topography of the entire Earth. Where did they get that? Well, actually, Keyhole was the name of the reconnaissance satellites that uh, the the CIA and National Reconnaissance Office and whatever other agencies they haven't even told us exist yet were sending up back in the 50s, 60s, 70s to, to map the Earth. Well, that was initially, that, those were spy satellites that were then spun off into this company called Keyhole that developed this thing that Google eventually took over. And Keyhole was a company that was being uh, financed by Incutel, which most people haven't heard of, but is the CIA's venture capital fund. Yes, the CIA runs a venture capital fund where they invest in these various tech startups that they find interesting. And more often than not, when you go back to some Gugad or Gadget along these lines that's been developed, you find at some point in their past they've got either InQtel funding or funding through uh, through the back door through some other agency. But that's how, ultimately, the CIA ended up with shares of Google back in 2004 because they had these uh, keyhole stocks that then got transferred to Google and so the CIA ended up holding these Google. I isn't that strange? Isn't that funny how that works? And of course, that's just one of the many connections between Google and the deep state. In fact, back in 2010, a federal judge ruled that yes, there there is a, a, a relationship between Google and the NSA, but no, you can't find out about it. That is that is uh, official state secrets. That was actually ruled in court back in 2010, and that was eight years ago. And uh, of course, Google has only expanded its uh, its empire since then. So yes, the the deep state connections run very deep with companies like that. So how do we know that something like a DuckDuckGo is not also watched very closely? An excellent question. And the real, I mean, here's the unsettling answer. We don't. I mean, you, you can't right. really know what they are doing. They say they are not recording and, and storing your searches. But how do you know that? And the other layer of that is maybe they are 100% truthful and on the level and they are they're absolutely not connected to the deep state. But... We know, again, through things like Room 641 and uh, the whistleblower who blew the whistle on that, whose name I'm going to forget off the top of my head, but people can look it up easily enough. We know that the NSA is tapping into the trunk lines of the internet, i.e. all of the data that's flowing through the internet, through these major hubs in San Francisco and New York and other places across the United States. All of that data is being gobbled up wholesale by the NSA. So anything that's passing through there theoretically, is going to be collected. And if it's not encrypted, they're going to find it. So, yes, I mean, DuckDuckGo and other services like this can say that they're not collecting searches and, you know, you've got a secure connection to their server, or so they say, but what what's routing you to their server? And, again, there's about 15 okay, different James, ways. I have to interrupt you one more time. We've got to go into one of those breaks. Stay with us. This is Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway, visiting with James Corbett. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Power Hour Radio with your host, Dr. Joanne Conaway, visiting this morning with James Corbett. And I want to refer you to his sites, CorbettReport.com. And Corbett is C-O-R-B-E-T-T. -T. So CorbettReport.com. And Corbett Report slash Privacies was the page that I found so interesting. So before I let you go this morning, <laughs> one thing that I would like you to talk about, and this this is something that really raises my blood pressure. But in your privacies, you, you allude to several different privacies that are being invaded and in a big way. But the privacy of DNA, I find it fascinating with what I'm learning about what they're learning about you and learning from you with all of these DNA testing companies that are out there. 
Yeah, it's quite disturbing uh, to watch the rise of these companies. Hey, find out about your ancestry and just send us your genetic samples and we'll tell you all about it. And then you find out, as it's reported later on, oh yeah, and police and other law enforcement agencies are requesting data about people's DNA from these ancestry services because, hey, they're looking into a a murder victim or whatever and they have some genetic material. Can we match it to someone in your database? And isn't that a good enough reason for law enforcement to get your genetic material? Uh, Unfortunately, that's just the really, the the, the sort of, the, the, the bigger aspect of this that people can see. But this has been happening in country after country around the globe for a number of years now. More countries are creating and storing genetic material, DNA samples, sometimes under the guise of, well, it's criminals, so we will connect collect their DNA in the same way we'd collect their fingerprints. Um, but uh, increasingly in non-criminals, they will uh, find excuses to collect DNA. And uh, that's, I mean, it should be disturbing because ultimately this is the building blocks of who you are. Talk about privacy. Genetic privacy is something that is not really on the radar screen of most people, but uh, you have to turn to science fiction, crazy science fiction like Gattaca, which is about this future state where you have to be extremely careful with your genetic material uh, because it's constantly collected and examined by the government. So if you're, you know, if you're trying to do anything outside the bounds of what the government says you are allowed to do, well, you're going to be a genetic criminal and they're going to discover it from your fingernails or your hair or, you know, microscopic things that, that uh, you leave behind everywhere you go. And uh, again, this is, it sounds like science fiction craziness, but so does so much of what we are living through right now would have sounded like science fiction craziness a decade ago. Well, exactly. You know, it's interesting because I've just recently, after all these many years, um, read 1984. (laughs) And I find it fascinating. So much was revealed. And, you know, of course, back then when the book was first written, it was probably thought to be, ah, this is crazy stuff, but it's not so crazy. We know that it's not so crazy. So, you know, the sad reality, and especially when you're talking about these sites that take your genetic material and make a decision or a determination about your background. I know, for example, I've heard several times complaints from both Ancestry.com and 23andMe. They'll take samples from identical twins. Now, these people are not identical twins that were separated at birth and one went with one family and one went with another family. It's nothing like that. These are identical twins that live in the same house. They send in their DNA and they get different reports. Their backgrounds are entirely different. Now, to me, there's no validity in a 23andMe report or a an Ancestry.com report. I'm, I'm sorry, I won't subject myself to one. I don't believe that it works that way. But the fascinating thing is these people are collecting this data and sharing it. Yeah. And uh, do you know about the, uh, the, the founder of the 23andMe? Just happened to be the wife no. of the found, co-founder of Google? Isn't that interesting? And in <laughs> fact, Google invested $3.9 million in 23andMe back in 2007. So it all goes back to the same places, funnily enough. Isn't that interesting? Of all the people in the world, it yeah. just happens to go back to the people who are out there to collect as much data on the human race as possible, as they talk about in openly. Google is out there to put all of human knowledge and everything on, on uh, collect it all. Well, now they're collecting genetic material, too, um, through through the back door. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Yes, but not surprising, no, you know, to no, your sadly, point. I no. mean, we find over and over and over again these links. I mean, when you when you listen to certain people that are in that are actually interviewed talking about things like even the um the thing with Hillary Clinton and all of that that was going on and find out who is connected to whom and to whom and to whom and it's like, "Oh my gosh, really?" <laughs> it's like there was this web that was being built and it's amazing how they all work together and it was all behind the scenes and so when we look at things like this you know another thing that I found interesting when I was looking at the privacies was the information that you talk about with respect to privacy of thought that really bothers me because that is supposed to be one of our most precious things nobody's supposed to be able to get to our thoughts 
Yes, not supposed to, but uh, they're trying, and uh, they're having mm-hmm. some sort of success with it. Uh, how much, I think, is debatable, but at any rate, progress is being made, because a lot of money is being pumped in right now to try to access people's thoughts and find ways to decode that electronically and from a distance. And again, sounds like crazy sci-fi fantasy until you start looking at the research that's already being done about how uh, brain scans are now being used to reconstruct images in people's minds, and somewhat reliably. Uh, Actually, the latest imagery I have uh, that I included in that uh, podcast was from 2014, where already computers were doing a pretty good job of reconstructing an image that people were looking at from their brain scans. Uh, Isn't that crazy? But that's just the beginning of it. And now they're starting to do... Um, mind messaging between people, sending thoughts between people through a distance, through um, brain brain chips, basically, uh, translating thoughts into words, and pretty soon we're going to have the brain chip in one form or another. And this really is the f- the final frontier when it comes to invasion of privacy, because if you don't have privacy within your own head, your own thoughts then it's game over. What else, what other kind of privacy really exists? And you'll notice that in 1984, at least that was the one privacy that Winston had until he was caught and turned into a big brother lover. He could be private in his own thoughts, in his own head. Well, not anymore, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, and that's that's really scary as far as I'm concerned. I, You know, I think about it, and this is one thing that has always been true in my life. I know that my thoughts are my thoughts, and if I choose to share them, that's one thing, and if not, they remain my thoughts, but maybe not so much anymore, and that's what's scary to me. Well, James, I hear that music in the background signaling the end of another Power Hour radio show, and I would love to invite you to come back again. This is something that I think is... And not only fascinating, but also scary and enlightening and many adjectives I could give to it. But you have been a tremendous interview, someone who has really opened the eyes of many people listening, I know. And I wish you the best of the rest of the day and look forward to having you on again. Anytime you need me, just let me know. All right. Thank you so much. I've been visiting with James Corbett. Again, get out to CorbettReport.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back again tomorrow. Have a great rest of the day. So long for now. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.